The Rainmaker Multiplier On Demand Series is brought to you by Clarity to Prosperity, a financial training, coaching, and IP development organization led by financial advisors, coaches, and business leaders committed to taking a holistic approach to advising. To learn more about our organization and upcoming training opportunities for financial professionals, visit ClarityToProsperity.com. Welcome, everybody. I'm super excited to have Pat Quinn with us today. He spoke at our Mastermind Collegium and uh, was a huge hit and uh, just an unbelievable amount of uh, wisdom and knowledge and experience that comes out of his mouth. So I'm excited to have him sharing more with you, especially catered to hunting in a virtual environment, doing marketing in a virtual environment. Uh, To do marketing, you got to speak really well. And that's what Pat is a master at, is communications and speaking. So welcome, Pat. Thanks for being here. Hey, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you were just telling me you've done a ton of podcasts recently, huh? Yeah, this is such an important time for everybody. It's a great opportunity because a lot of the barriers that people had to having a second opinion, to having people look at their situation, and even the barriers to an initial meeting are down. You think about six months ago to come to a seminar, to come to a workshop, you had to leave your house. You had to find an evening where you were absolutely free and had nothing else. You had to find childcare if you had kids. And then to come to that meeting, you had to get directions, fight traffic, get there. Now, because we're living in a virtual world, so many of those barriers are down. And because we're living in the middle of one or two or three crises right now, uh, people are more open to trying new things, having a second opinion, have a second set of eyes on the same situation. And so this is a huge opportunity, one that we certainly want to take advantage of, one that we want to have confidence in our communication and move forward, not freeze during this important time. 100%. Yeah, well said. And you know, Pat, for those who didn't see you at our Mastermind Collegium, um, you mind giving a little bit of background on yourself and kind of what brought you to being the, uh, the speaking guru you are today? Well, I actually didn't get my start as a professional speaker. I got my start as a professional magician, and I worked magic for 10 years professionally. After that time, I decided I needed to get a real job, and I became a a public school teacher and taught high school math for 12 years. During that time, I picked up an advanced degree in how adults learn, and so I really bring two things to the table. The first is a little bit of stagecraft from my years of doing magic, and the second is a real understanding of how adults learn. I'm hyper-focused on the audience, how the audience hears your presentation, hears your communication, Here's the things and processes the things that you say. And so I want to make sure that we're not just talking to ourselves or talking to a camera or talking to, you know, other advisors. I want to make sure that we're talking to an audience and they're hearing what we're actually saying. And the beauty of this is that every single thing that I advise when it comes to speaking works whether you're on stage in front of 20 people or 200 people. It works whether you're online in front of five people or 50 people. And it works in one-on-one conversations on the phone, on Zoom, and in your office. And so the same communication strategies that we use in front of groups is the same strategies we use online and one-on-one. And I've been fortunate enough over the last 10 years to work with some of the greatest speakers in the world. We work with Damon John from Shark Tank. We work with Tony Robbins and Dean Graciosi, Grant Cardone, Michael Hyatt. But most of the people that we work with are not professional speakers. Most of the people that we work with are business owners, just like you, who want to grow their business and attract new clients through speaking, whether that's speaking one-on-one or speaking one-to-many. We help you with strategic communication. How do you communicate so the audience wants to take action? See, we only have one measure of success. Our measure of success is not that people would come up to you afterwards and say, wow, that was a great webinar, or wow, you're a really good speaker. Our only measure of success is that the audience would want to do business with you after the presentation. That's our only measure of success. And so we want to build things into every conversation, into every presentation that cause the audience to want to engage with you, have that first meeting, have that next meeting. 
We build that into every conversation. And the stuff that we tell you to build into your presentation and into your conversations, they're not our opinion. If you want an opinion, go ask your sister. What I'm gonna share with you today are research-based strategies from the research of Robert Cialdini, Daniel Pink, Scott Adams, Neil Strauss, Richard Thaler's Nobel Prize winning uh, economics papers. Uh, this is research that shows what causes people to take action at the end of a conversation or at the end of any presentation. Yeah, that's fantastic. <laughs> I'm very familiar with all those names and it's like, you know, I've read uh, probably two thirds of the books of the names you just said, but it's like, you know, to have one person that's become the expert on all these things that, yeah, I read the book and even some of them I might have went back and highlighted and tried to implement, but uh, just powerful that, you know, this is uh, what you're dedicated to. You know, I'm thinking about, so my office, for example, we've done live presentations for years. And, um, and now since April 16th, we, today we just completed our 13th virtual seminar since April 16th. So, and I'll tell you what, the first uh, six or seven were beyond ugly. <laughs> I mean, it was a shit show, it was, it was not good. But we've gotten substantially better and improved upon it. But you know, there's some things that we've learned that worked in a live environment doesn't work virtually. And the other things we realized that like, like listen, we really need to step this up in a virtual environment that in the live environment wasn't as important. But um, what you're working with so many advisors around the country, I wanna hear from you. What, what, work, what do you think needs to stay and what needs to go and what needs to be added and what's more important now? Sure, well, great way to ask the question because uh, what needs to stay the same is something a lot of people miss. So let's talk about that first and then we'll talk about the things that need to change. The first thing that needs to stay the same is that you should have a structure to your presentation. And we like a four part structure. The opening part is opening heart. It is not to get into your content. It is not to read your resume. It is to connect with the audience. The second part is your content. We call that the head, where you actually help the audience with real solutions. We don't just try to sell them something. We don't just describe the problem. We give them real help and real solutions. That doesn't change. You should do that in person. You should do that online. The third part is the call to action. We call that the hands because we're actually going to ask them to do something. For many advisors in the initial presentation, that's to set up a free appointment, to come in for a free appointment or to set up a Zoom time so we can talk one-on-one. -on -one. But you don't end there. A lot of people make the mistake of ending with their call to action and that's a mistake. It's a mistake because there's two types of decision makers in your audience. There are tactical decision makers and emotional decision makers. And if you end with your tactical call to action, you're leaving 50% of your customers behind. We want you to have a fourth part to your presentation and that is a closing heart story. And so when you put the four parts together, it's heart, head, hands, and heart. And the purpose of that closing heart story is so the emotional decision makers will also feel comfortable moving forward with you. I can always tell which type of decision maker any presenter or any advisor is just by watching them speak. If I'm watching a tactical decision maker, when they get to the end, they're all tactics. It's a, it's a 45 minute appointment. You should bring in this paperwork. It happens at my office. Here's the address. Don't turn right on red. There's a sign that says don't turn right on red right in front of the office. It's tactics, 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 tactics. And the emotional decision makers in the room are just left high and dry. But I can also tell when there's an emotional decision maker speaking, because the emotional decision maker is all emotion. He'll, he'll just stand up and say, it'll feel good. Trust me, when you have this taken care of, it will feel so good. You're gonna breathe a sigh of relief. And the audience is sitting there like, what is it? And, and they're like, it doesn't matter, it'll feel good. It's actually the speaker who can do both, who can tactically tell me what it is and emotionally tell me how it will feel who will get the maximum number of people to sign up for that. And by the way, if you're, if you're speaking to couples or selling into couples, and you are, either one of them can veto the appointment. Either one of them can say no. And you should know that most married couples are one tactical decision maker married to one emotional decision maker. And so you've got to get good at both of these. And so the last two parts of the presentation are that tactical close and that emotional close. And so that doesn't change. If you're live in the room with a group of people, you should go heart, head, hands, heart. 
If you're online, you should go heart, head, hands, heart. If you're on the phone with one person, you should go heart, head, hands, heart. So don't change that. What should change? What should change are the specific stories, first of all, that you tell in that opening sequence. We used to advise uh, people to tell a connecting story that really created their why, why you do what you do. You wanna try to be ordinary and connect with your audience on some level and also show your why. Well, what we've learned from advisors in the last three months is that that older story, that story maybe from your childhood or maybe when you first got into the business, those older stories are dated for lack of a better term. And what's connecting with people better are a more recent story. Remember the purpose of the opening. The purpose of the opening sequence is not to teach your audience about finance or about investing or income streams during retirement. The purpose of the story is to build trust and build connection. I'll honestly tell you, there's never been a better time in the world to build connection than right now. Is there another time in the world when we all have experienced the same thing at the same time? Usually, even if we're experiencing the same thing, we're watching it on different news channels, so we're experiencing it completely differently. But in the last 60 to 90 days, the entire world has been experiencing the same thing. Shortages of certain things, more time at home, lack of being able to go to the social places that we go, washing our hands a lot more than we've used to. And so we want a story that shows that I'm experiencing it too. And so we love stories from the last 60 days. Remember, this opening story doesn't have to be an amazing, life-changing moment, okay? I coach a guy who climbed to the top of Mount Everest. I coach a guy who climbed to the top of Mount Everest, and when he tells that story of getting to the top of Mount Everest, guess how many other people in the room can relate to that? Not one of them. I coach another person who talks in his opening story about arguing with his wife about whether the toilet paper should come out over the top or underneath the bottom. Now, when he tells that story in front of an audience, how many other people in the room can relate to that? Every single one of them. We don't wanna judge our opening stories based on how many people come up to, up to us afterwards and say, wow, that was an amazing story. Now, we wanna judge our opening stories and our closing stories too, based on how many people come up to us afterwards and say, that same thing happened to me. And so we just need an ordinary story. I thought I'd love more time with my family until I had more time with my family. You know, I never thought I'd appreciate going to the post office. Now going to the post office is like a big outing in our family, like we're out, woo! Like those are the ordinary moments that we're all experiencing together. Yeah. And those are the moments that you should share in the opening of your presentation because they don't seem dated. They actually are like, wow, you get what we're going through. Now you can roll out of that opening story into your old, hey, here's why I do what I do. Here's why I'm trustworthy. Here's why you should like me. You can roll out of that, but it's a little tone deaf to tell the same story today that you were telling six months ago because the world isn't the same today as it was six months ago. And so we want to change that opening content. You know, that, that middle part, our content, what we actually teach to the audience. Now, some people are changing that content and some people are not. Some people have adjusted their title and adjusted their topic to how to survive in a crisis, how to invest in a pandemic, how to make sure your retirement is still safe even when the world isn't. They've adjusted their content. I think the big things that people are worried about haven't really changed. Do I have enough? Will my money last? Will I outlive my money? Will they be okay? And so the universal topics of income in retirement, protecting your money in a volatile environment, uh, paying as little taxes as possible, and will my family be okay after I'm gone, those are questions that haven't gone away. Those things haven't changed. Now, do we put a little spin on them? You certainly can. And I don't know, you can choose to do that or choose not to do that. I would just make sure that your stories that you're telling and the stories are the bridge that connect your content to your audience. The stories are the bridge that allow the audience to see themselves in your content. Make sure those stories that you're telling are recent stories. Because if you're telling a story from a year ago, everybody recognizes that the world isn't the same place. 
So you could still have one of your topics be income in retirement, but I wouldn't have a story of somebody who stopped by your office and had a conversation with you two years ago. I'd have a story of somebody who you were on a Zoom call with two weeks ago and they were getting ready to retire and you talked to them about income in retirement. I think even if we don't update our topics, because the topics we're covering are answering universal questions of will I have enough? Will my money last? Will they be okay? Will this be okay in a volatile environment? Those topics don't change, but I think our stories need to change so that people recognize that we're adjusting as the world is adjusting. Your call to action is probably the same. I'd like a, an appointment, a first appointment with you. Of course, that appointment will probably be online. It'll be on Zoom. The good news is, one thing we've seen over the last 90 days is how comfortable even older people have become using Zoom. My wife leads a Bible study. There's probably nine ladies in it over the age of 70. And the, uh, the first time, it was like, it was hard the first time. <laughs> like getting the cameras and the microphones to work, uh, that took maybe the whole hour. But I watched it last Wednesday night. I watched our Bible study, and these 70-year-old ladies are as comfortable as they could be on Zoom. They're loving it. And so the good news is your clientele has become more and more comfortable uh, with Zoom. And then the closing story, uh, I think, is the same, same goal we had before, to leave them on an emotional, good-feeling story that lets them know safety and comfort and peace of mind are possible, even in the middle of this pandemic. And so that's what stays the same, and that's what changes in the four-part story structure that we put into every presentation. That's, that's awesome. That's really, really good stuff. Um, you know, I'm thinking about these virtual seminars, and you, you wanna create a sense of urgency, right? You wanna, you wanna kinda create a little bit of a wedge or like let people know that, you know, there's, there's a problem, right, that needs to be solved, right? So, you know, to meet with you type of thing. But on the other hand, with all the uncertainty and everything that's going on, um, we really don't want to be scaring people or making them feel stupid or whatever. So it's such a delicate balance. Talk to me about that and strategy wise, like, you know, what, what should we be doing? Well, let's talk about nonverbal communication first, because l let me just say this, we're not scaring people. People are already scared. Yeah. Uh, people are afraid for their health. People are afraid because it's pretty obvious we're headed into a global recession from what you see and read. Uh, and so they're scared out. And we're not doing anything to create scared. They're already scared. So what I want to communicate when I'm communicating online is calm, comfort, and safety. So here are some things you should be conscious of. Slow your voice down. Slow the pace of your speaking down. Because the faster you speak, the more it looks like you're panicking too. Lower the tone of your voice. This comes out of research from Stephen Martin in Great Britain in a great book called The Messengers, Who We Trust and Why We Trust Them. And one of the things it talks about is that people with lower voices are more trusted, especially in a time of crisis. So I think of it like this. You have three voices. You have a nose voice. And when you're speaking out of your nose voice, your voice gets a little nasally, it gets a little higher. When that happens, you naturally talk faster. And when you talk faster using your known noise voice, you are panicking. This is what you talk like when you're panicking. You've got a throat voice, which is a little deeper. And then you've got a third voice, which is what's called your chest voice, or what I like to call your heart voice. And when you speak from your chest, your voice naturally gets deeper, it naturally gets broader, and it naturally slows down. And here's what I know. When you're slower and lower, people trust you. People view you as confident. People are more likely to move toward you when they're scared than move away from you. If you use a high voice and talk really fast, you may think, wow, I'm showing them my enthusiasm and my excitement. What you're really showing them is that you're panicking and you're scared and you're rushing and you're making bad decisions. But the person who speaks in a low, slow voice is the one who exudes confidence and comfort and safety and peace. And so I want you to be as low and slow as possible, and that's gonna really communicate that even though we're all scared, 
that I have confidence and I know the right path to get you out of this. I wanna share one other uh, bit of research that comes from Richard Thaler's Nobel Prize winning, he did a, a uh, economics paper, he won the Nobel Prize in economics for behavioral economics in the middle of a crisis. What causes people to take action in the middle of a crisis compared to what causes people to freeze in the middle of a crisis. And so we wanna become familiar with this type of communication. We call this VUCA communication. This is what the paper was about. VUCA communication, VUCA stands for volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous times. And man, if we've ever been in VUCA times, we are in VUCA times. These are VUCA times right now. Uh, it is volatile, it's uncertain, we're in multiple crises at the same time. These are VUCA times. And so in VUCA times, a human being's natural reaction is to freeze. And maybe you've heard this. Maybe you've had customers say, you know, I want to do something, but just not right now. I think I want to make a change, but you know, I'm going to wait until this is over until I make that change. And that's a natural human reaction. When we're in shifting times, our natural reaction is to freeze and not do anything. And so how do you get people to take action in the middle of a crisis? How do you get people to take action in VUCA times? Let me give you some very specific things that you should build into your communication. The first one is ego bias. We wanna take advantage of ego bias. Ego bias is to let people know that they're in control. Not situations, not circumstances, not chance. You, you are in control. Everybody loves to be in control. And even if you're not a control freak like I am, you still don't want other people determining your outcome. And so how does this sound like in communication, whether you're on the phone, whether you're on a group call, whether you're in front of 150 people, you should say things like this. You know, how you come out of this crisis, how you come out of the next six months financially isn't left up to chance, isn't left up to circumstances, isn't left up to other people. How you come out of the next six months is going to be determined by the choices that you make. It's going to be determined by the decisions that you make and the actions that you take. You get to choose. You have control over what moves you make and what choices you make and what actions you take. Not chance, not circumstance, no virus. You are the one who gets to determine how we come out of this. And that is appealing right to somebody's ego bias. And it's extremely attractive. It's extremely attractive to get people to take action, that they get to control the outcome, not chance or not circumstance. The other uh, bias that I think that you should probably lean into at this time is congruence. Now, people always want to be congruent. And how an advisor would use congruent, one-on-one -on -one or in a group presentation, is early in the conversation or early in the presentation, ask people if they belong to a certain group. Like, are you the type of person who when things get a little crazy, you're the type of person who likes to freeze or the type of person who likes to take action? Are you the type of person who likes to do nothing and just sit on your hands? Or are you the type of person who likes to take action and make things better? All right, then later in your presentation, when it comes time to do the call to action, you can call in that little bank card, that little credit that you just created there. At the end of your presentation, 20 minutes later, you can say, if you're the type of person who doesn't wanna sit on your hands, if you're the type of person who wants to take action, now is the time to sign up for an appointment. You can click on the scheduling link and sign up for an appointment right now. So if you're, if you're the type of person who just wants to sit there and do nothing, don't click on that button. But if you said you were the type of person who likes to take action, now is the time to click on that button. And you put the audience in one of two possibilities. They can either click on that button and schedule an appointment, or they can be non-congruent. And nobody wants to be non-congruent. It is really, Robert Cialdini's research on congruence has been around for 25 years and so few people take advantage of it. But if you're the type of person who likes to take action, you should do this. When 20 minutes later you told me you were the type of person who wants to take action. I mean, you are, you're in a box, you're cornered in. You can either take action, the action I just told you, or you can be non-congruent, and it is really hard to be non-congruent. And so that's really easy to build into individual conversations on the telephone. 
that's really easy to build into, in, you know, you're talking to a couple on Zoom, and you can get the couple to turn to each other and be like, no, no, we're action takers. Uh, and then later you can be like, well, if you're action takers, then really the next thing to do is we'll call your current advisor and have them send me over the information. And it's like, well, you boxed them in at that point. And, and it really helps people in the middle of a crisis take the next step because you know their natural response is going to be to freeze, but you also know freezing is what's going to hurt them at this important time. The last thing you should do right now is freeze. And so you really are gonna help them make the right decision simply by having them be congruent with how they, how they vision themselves and how they picture themselves in the first place. And so I would lean into ego bias and lean into congruence to help people take action during this difficult and, and honestly pretty scary times. Man, that's such good stuff. Uh, the ego bias, right? So give me a quick, you know, summary of that again, like the ego bias. Totally got the congruency. Yep. So ego bias is letting the audience know that they're in control. Mm -hmm. And so everybody wants to be in control. It is your job to let them know that you're in control. You're in control of the outcome of the situation, not chance, not circumstance. And so in, in plain speak, you just come out and say it. Look, yeah. you know, how your retirement looks at the end of this pandemic is up to you. Not chance, not circumstance, not the president, not the Congress, not the virus. It's up to you. The actions that you take, the decisions that you make, that is what is going to determine how your retirement looks, how your, what the outlook for your retirement is at the end of this pandemic. You get to choose whether you're going to hold things the way they are or make some changes. You get to choose whether you're going to freeze at this important moment or take action at this important moment. Nobody else gets to decide that or push that upon you. You get to choose that. Now, if every other advisor that they work with and every other advisor in the world is out there saying, well, we don't know what the future holds. We don't know what Congress is going to do. We don't know how long the virus is going to last. We don't know when things are going to open up. All they're saying is it's out of your control, it's out of your control, it's out of your control, it's out of your control. The one person who stands up in front of them and says, this is under your control. You're going to choose the moves you make and the, decision, the, the decisions that you make. You're going to choose. And how you come out of this will be determined by the decisions that you make. You're not promising results. What you are is giving them control. And they want that. They, in a world where you feel like you're losing control, and especially for our older clientele who feel like the world that they like is slipping away and the world that they knew is slipping away, to give them a sense of control again and say, look, you get to choose. The actions that you take, the moves that you make, the choices that you will make in the next month are going to have a huge, uh, you know, they're, they're the ones that are going to determine what this looks like on the back end, not somebody else not random chance, not a virus for sure. You get to choose. That's leaning into ego bias. And, and that's really, I mean, I can use ego bias on, in, you know, for just about any situation. We get to choose the outcome of this. We get to choose by the decisions, by whether or not we go grocery shopping now, we get to choose what's for dinner. By how we discipline our kids today, we get to choose how they turn out as adults. I mean, people, when, when they feel like things are out of control, to give them back control and say, no, it's actually the choices you make. That's extremely attractive in a crisis. Now there's other times where we're just like, no, no, you do it for me. But in a crisis, when we feel like things are slipping away, the research shows that leaning into ego bias is one of the smartest things that you can do. So the environment right now is there is a lot of um, the advisors that are, you know, that are part of our group or following our podcast. Um, that are now, you know, taking the plunge, right? They're, they're action takers and they're actually doing virtual seminars now. And so um, off the top of your head, Pat, you know, give me like seven, 10 quick tips, right? Of what are best practices they need to be doing to be speaking and communicating effectively in a virtual environment. 
what are te- you know give, give us some tips off the top of your head if you would sure. well the first one is uh just do it your first one will not be your best one but you can't have a second one until you have a first one and so if you're waiting until you look perfect you're never going to like how you look okay and so you should just do it and your your fifth one will be better than your fourth one your tenth one will be better than your ninth one just get out there and you don't have to have big crowds you know one of my core philosophies is low stakes practice before high stakes opportunity. And so one of the advisors who was at our workshop uh, is Tim, and we worked on Tim's presentation, and for the 10 days after he came to our two-day workshop, where we help advisors write their signature talk and their presentations, for the 10 days afterwards, he held a webinar a day for 10 days. You know his average attendance? Three. One day he had seven, but one day he only had one. But he did it anyway, and he answered questions. He actually picked up one or two clients. But I tell you, I saw his first one, and I saw his 10th one, and his 10th one was head and shoulders above his first one. If you go on Facebook right now and say, hey, at noon tomorrow, I'm going to hold a 45-minute webinar on how to handle, how to prepare for retirement in the middle of a pandemic, you're going to get a couple people to click on it. You're going to get a couple people to show up, and it'll be okay. And if you do it the next day, it'll be okay -er. And if you do it the next day, it'll be okay, good. And if you do it the next day, it'll be good. And and maybe your average attendance will be five. And then, then on your 10th one, then what Tim did on his 10th one, then he advertised. And he had 120 people on his 10th one. And his 10th one was good. So low stakes practice with small audiences before high stakes opportunity in front of big audiences and expensive audiences and audiences that we paid for, um, that's my first advice. Now lighting is important, brighter lights in front of you than behind you. If they can't see your face, they can't see your lips. If they can't see your lips, most older people can't hear what you're saying. And so uh, make sure that you're well lit. Sound is everything, and so I highly advise a separate microphone, even if you're using a good camera, like I use the Logitech C920, which is what so many people use. Um, It's got a great microphone built right into the camera, but there's no replacement for a good microphone. Uh, Just about everybody I know uses the Yeti microphone, Y-E-T-I, by a company named Blue. Um, Everybody holds it up. (laughs) Every time I I advise that, half the room is like, what's the Yeti? The other half holds it up in front of the camera. Um, (laughs) It is so crystal clear sound. It it changes. Don't use your laptop microphone. And I wouldn't, I love the Logitech C920 as a camera and it's got great sound, um, but there's no comparison to a separate USB plug-in microphone. These are not expensive investments. These are under, you know, $150 probably. Um, and so get a good camera, get a good microphone, because sound is everything. Your background should not be noticeable. If people remember your background, you're doing it wrong. Uh, but your, your background should just be blah, because you don't want them to focus on that. Remember, one of the goals of our presentations is to lower interference. Interference is anything that comes between your message and the audience hearing your message. I also want your presentation to be simple and short. Uh, An online presentation, I don't think there's any reason to go over 40 or 45 minutes. There's so many more distractions online that you need to shorten the presentation and simplify the presentation. My goal, my ultimate goal, is that the audience would spend less than 25% of their brain thinking about your presentation. I picture the human brain, the audience brain, like uh, the the computer, the CPU on your computer. And I don't know if you've ever been to that screen on your computer where you can see how much of your processing power you're using. And there's sometimes when like you're downloading a video or you're playing a game, or you're doing something really hard on your computer. And it's like, and all those lights are on and it's, and the fan comes on and the whole thing's like shaking. And then there's other times on your computer when you're not doing anything, you're checking your email the fan isn't even on. And if you go to that screen, it's like all the lights are down and you're using like 20% or less of your processing power. Well, here's what I want. When the audience is listening to your presentation, I want them using 20% or less of their processing power because I want the other 80% of their processing power to be doing the one thing they should be doing during your presentation. And that is rehearsing taking the next step with you, which is why the one thing that should never change 
is embedding the next step. You shouldn't wait until the end of your presentation to let people know that you'd like to have an appointment with them. Early in your presentation, you should tell a story, a recent story, a story about someone who was on one of your webinars last week. And during the webinar, they asked a question. And at the end of the webinar, they clicked on the link and they signed up for an appointment. And when they were on that Zoom call with you in that appointment, you asked them this and they said this and tell, map out the entire customer journey. The journey is webinar to click, click to schedule, schedule the appointment, the appointment to great success or the appointment to having all your questions answered, no results promised. Uh, and so I think that just mapping that customer journey and you don't have to go into their detailed situations. This is all going to go through compliance because all you're mapping is there was Mary and Bob were on one of my webinars last week. And at the end of the webinar, when they had the opportunity to schedule an appointment, they clicked on the link to schedule the appointment. And two days later, Mary and Bob and I were on a Zoom call together, very much like this Zoom call. And during that Zoom call, Mary asked a question. Mary said, well, I have to keep working longer now because the economy has gone down a little bit. And here's the answer I gave them. Da, 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 whatever the answer is. And you can teach, what could you teach? You could teach life insurance there, you could teach annuities there, you could teach multiple sources of income there, you could teach investing over the long run, you could teach a thousand things there. Mm -hmm. But what you did in that teaching was to let them know that we go from webinar to click, click to appointment, appointment to having your questions answered. That's all you want to map for them. So that when you get to the call to action 20 minutes later, it doesn't surprise them. One of the reasons people's conversion rates are low in an unper in an in-person seminar or in an online webinar is that you don't bring it up until the end and people haven't had a chance to rehearse it. As human beings, we don't do anything that we don't rehearse hundreds of times in our heads ahead of time. And so when you get to the end of your presentation and you haven't mentioned the appointment, and then you're like, by the way, I'd love to meet with you. Click on the link below and schedule an appointment. Thanks for being here today. I hope you guys had a great time. They, they get like five seconds and they're like, I don't know if I want an appointment or not. I haven't had a chance to think about it. But if 10 minutes into your presentation, you tell the story about Bob and Mary who clicked on a link and got their questions answered, and 10 minutes later, you tell the story of Roger and Sue, who were on a webinar three weeks ago, clicked on a link, had an appointment, and had this question answered. All of this 80% of the audience's brain is like, I wonder if we should have an appointment. Boy, I have some questions I'd like answered. I wonder if he would answer my questions. I wonder if the appointment's in his office or if it's in Zoom. And, and they're practicing, and they're thinking about it, and they're ready for it. So when you get to the end and tell them about it, they aren't shocked. They aren't surprised. Their response, I thought you'd never ask. I've been thinking about this for the last 20 minutes. I was hoping you would ask me if I'd like to meet with you. I was hoping you'd ask me if I have any questions that you can answer in a one-on-one -on -one appointment because they've been practicing doing it for the last 30 minutes. And so the one thing that should not change is embed the customer journey in your stories early so that when you make the offer late, it's not a surprise, it's not a shock, and the audience's response is I thought you'd never ask. You do that and you're gonna see conversion rates in your webinars that are through the roof and much better than they have. And that's the sort of thing we help people every day with at our workshops, uh, putting together those embedded stories that perfectly lead to the call to action so that the audience is ready for it at the end of the presentation. Well, Pat, this audience might be ready for it because you've been doing your story and your training a couple times throughout. <laughs> no, I'm, I, uh, I do want to, I'm ready for it. I want to hear about um, your, the schedule of your training, uh, when the next one is, what the cost is. And even when I say schedule, I mean like the agenda, right? What exactly happens over the course of those two days? So it's yeah. a two-day workshop. We hold them virtually, and so there's no travel. You don't have to take extra days off of work. Uh, the two days are jam-packed full, and in those two days, uh, I sit down with you, and we write your entire signature block. They're a small group event, so there's other people there, but I'm there. I'm helping you choose your opening story, map out your opening story, and practice your opening story. 
I'm there to help you choose your three topics of content. What are the most relevant topics of content? What do you want to teach during those times? I'm there to help you with your call to action. If you're uncomfortable at that part of your presentation, you're not alone. I help people every single day become comfortable with that transition from content to the offer, asking for the appointment. And we do it in a way that doesn't feel salesy, that doesn't feel slimy or high pressure. It'll be in a way that is so natural, you'll feel so good about it, that you'll do it confidently, whether you're online or on stage. And then we'll choose and practice that closing story so that you leave the audience in an emotional high, feeling peace of mind, comfort, and safety, and a maximum number of people in the room will take action. Now, advisors who come to our presentation see their numbers often double and triple in their conversion rate, and the show up rate for those appointments goes up as well because they know what they're gonna get. We build that right into the presentation, uh, all of it. And so we hold them every month uh, and you can learn more about it at advanceyourreach.com. Just click on the work with us uh, button, advanceyourreach.com. And if anybody has any specific questions, uh, you can always email me at pat at advanceyourreach.com. Awesome. And what's the cost for that, Pat? Uh, the cost for the workshop is $9,800. And I'll tell you this, every time you give a presentation, whether it's online or offline, uh, whether it's online or on stage, whether it's to one person or to 50 people, every time you give your presentation and it's not maximized for conversion, it's not structured correctly, you're leaving customers behind. Now, there's a dollars and cents uh, consequence to that for you. But what worries me more is the impact of that on people's lives, because I know what you do every single day helps people. I know what you do every single day gives people security and peace of mind and helps them through difficult situations and plan their future and have, have the future that they want in retirement. And so I'm more worried about the impact of people not taking the next step with you, which is why we're so focused right now on helping people with their online presentation. So the workshop will help you develop a presentation that's appropriate on stage when you get back to doing live seminars. But right now we're also focused on helping you with the online presentations because we know that's gonna be an important part of your business for the next six months or 12 months. We also know it's an economically viable part of your business moving forward even when live seminars do open up because it lowers the barriers to people attending and it lowers a lot of the, the reasons why people don't wanna come out and drive at night and find the right place. So uh, we think it should be part of your solution even going forward. Um, and so we wanna make sure that you're good at that. And everything that you learn in the workshop over the course of the two days, you also applies to one-on-one -on -one phone calls, one-on-one -on -one meetings, one-on-one -on -one conversations. And here's the best part. After you attend the two-day workshop, I will be your one-on-one -on -one coach for months after the workshop. That means after the two-day workshop, any time for the next six months after that, that you do a webinar, that you do a seminar, that you have a recording of you just practicing in your living room, send me the video and you and I will hop on the phone and I will be your one-on-one -on -one coach making this presentation perfect. I will coach you one-on-one -on, -one on this presentation until you say it is perfect. I think it's gonna pay for itself the first time you give the presentation. I mean, you know the value of a single customer. What if every time you gave a presentation, you got one or two extra customers because your presentation was correctly, because your conversion rate was 20% higher than it was, because your show up rate was 30% higher than it has been? What if every time you gave a presentation, the people who needed you the most took the action that they needed to take and scheduled that appointment with you? This is gonna pay for itself probably the first time you give a presentation after the workshop, if not the first time, the second time, because you know the value of a single customer. You know yeah. the lifetime value of a single customer. And so one or two extra customers, this is gonna pay for itself very quickly. No doubt. And so Pat, the signature talk, um, what about the PowerPoint slides that go with that talk, right? The graphic design and all that kind of stuff. What, how's it being handled? So, you know, and people say slides, and what I want you to do is stop saying slides and start saying visuals. Uh, yeah. All great presentations need visuals because a portion of your audience are visual learners, okay? Yeah. And so if you just talk with no visuals, 
then you are not going to reach your entire audience. You're not going to have that impact that we talked about. Right. But when you have visuals, you allow the whole audience to access your presentation. Now we have options. One of your options is slides and we can help you create slides that are as effective as possible. Online, I really want to caution you not to have slides from the start of your presentation to the end of your presentation because doing so shows a poor understanding of the purpose of each part of your presentation. In the opening story sequence, the purpose is to connect with your audience. Well, you don't connect with your audience when your audience is looking at a slide. Your face should be on the screen in that opening sequence. When you're teaching content, we're okay with slides showing. I don't think for 30 minutes straight, but I'm okay with some slides. During your call to action and your emotional close, I don't think you should have slides up because the purpose is to rebuild that trust. The purpose of the closing story is to draw out emotion. And looking at a slide doesn't draw out emotion. And so slides are one of your options, but recognize this, they're not your only option. You also have what I call live visuals. Live visuals are what would generally be considered like a flip chart. I have a flip chart right over here that I use sometimes in my presentations where I draw the visual live in front of the audience. Very exciting to watch. Sometimes I draw things wrong and people think that's funny, but you don't, you see it kind of happen in front of you. Some people on a webinar setting will use a whiteboard where they'll draw in front of the audience. But let me tell you your third option. And your third option is one that everybody watching this should use in a live presentation. And I think everybody watching this should use in your webinar online presentations as well. And those are props. Props are three-dimensional visuals that you hold. And three-dimensional visuals that you hold, whether you're online or on stage, three-dimensional visuals that you hold are so important to get the audience fully engaged. And so you may be familiar with advisors who use a tape measure and talk about how this part of your life is the accumulation phase, look how long that is. This part of your life is the distribution phase, That look how long that is, they use a tape measure. You might be familiar with some advisors who use buckets. There's a bucket of money that's taxed and a bucket of money that's not taxed and they have different reasons to use their buckets. There's lots of visuals that you can use. I often use my machete, I've got my machete right back here. And the reason I have my machete back here is because I know one of the things that you do is cut through the brush and cut through the branches. It's so confusing right now. So confusing because you're getting conflicting information. You watch the news and they say the economy is gonna do this. You pick up the paper and they say the economy is gonna do this. Your brother-in-law sends you an email and says you should do this. What do you believe? What do you know? You know, one of the things that we do in our office every single day for people just like you, for families just like you, is cut through all the branches, cut through all the, all the long grass and, and chart out a clear path. What a machete does is it cuts a clear path so you know exactly where you're going. And if you feel like you're stuck in the weeds right now, if you feel like you're stuck in the branches of retirement and you can't see where you're going and you can't even turn around and go backwards, well then you should schedule an appointment. You should click on the link right now because what we do is cut a clear path. We're gonna to talk to you about where you wanna go. We're gonna to talk to you about the best way to get there. And then we're gonna clear away all the information that you're hearing and that you don't know what to do with and just chart a clear path for you to get exactly where you wanna go in as short as time as possible. So click on the link now and schedule that. And let's start using this machete together. You know, a simple prop like that, people are not gonna remember what you taught about the Roth conversion theory. And people aren't gonna remember about what you taught about new tax laws that might be able to be used to your advantage. What they're gonna remember is, that guy's gonna clear a path for us to get where we're trying to go. And so, I really wanna encourage you, because really, the world is like a barrel of monkeys. Like, you're hearing so much stuff and you can get distracted by monkeys and they're just monkeys, but if you had a machete to cut through all that, not through the monkeys, don't, don't use the props together. So, <laughs> my, my point is, you guys gotta use props. Props are so, everybody perks up when a prop comes on the screen. Like you're listening with one ear and then a machete comes on the screen and you're like, what, what? This guy's got a machete in front of us. Or I squeezed an orange the other day during a webinar and said, you know, you don't, you can always tell what's on the outside just by looking at it. But until, until you're under pressure, and this crisis is really putting us under pressure, um, you, that's when you find out what's inside you. 
And some of you, when you squeeze, you're going to get lemon juice and it's going to leave a bad taste in your mouth. And some of you, when you squeeze, you're going to get sweet orange juice. And that's really what this recession that we're heading into or these uncertain economic times, that's really what it'll show. You know, everybody's financial plan looked just fine six months ago. But this pandemic, this crisis is really squeezing everybody's financial plan right now. And we're going to find out what's really inside. Some of you are going to find a really sour taste in your mouth at the back end of this. And some of you are going to be drinking sweet orange juice. And here's what I want you to know. You get to choose. You're in control. You are the one. The actions you take, the moves that you make are going to decide whether you're drinking lemon juice or orange juice on the other side of this crisis. So click on the link right now and let's find out what's in your plan and whether it's going to taste sweet at the end of all this. <laughs> I'm going to go get me a glass of sweet orange juice here in a minute. Now, if you just had an orange and a lemon and just held up like what's in your plan, like they all look good on the outside, you wouldn't yeah. know which one of these tastes good and which one doesn't. But when you're in a crisis, that squeezes everybody. Some of you are squeezed to the point that you're bickering with your spouse. Some of you are squeezed to the point that you can't stand your kids anymore. Some of you are squeezed financially for sure. And some of you are just a little bit stir crazy. Well, your financial plans are the same way. They're getting squeezed right now. Let's be honest. And you're going to find out what's really in them. Now, I don't want you to have a sour taste in your mouth. I want you to have a sweet retirement. So we can help you get there. Yep. It's great. Well, gonna, simple, gonna, simple props. Simple, simple props. Are, oh, yeah. so the, your question was about slides, and I gave the world's longest slide answer, which is slides are one of your options. But I would, use, I would definitely use props. Yeah. I like live visuals. They're harder online because the camera and things like that. In a room with people when you're doing seminars, I love drawing it out on a flip chart at least once in a while. It makes it seem a little more spontaneous. And then slides. But if, you, if you're using props and you're using live visuals like a flip chart, you'll have a lot fewer slides. Online, just make sure you're not using slides in the opening five minutes and the closing five minutes. Save your slides for your content. Save your slides for the things that you can teach better with visuals. And otherwise, just show your face. They want to see your face. They're going to do business with you at the end of this, not your slides at the end of this. Makes perfect sense. I'm going to ask you one Quick last question. In developing a signature talk, so right now what we're finding is uh, we're getting the highest response rates on estate planning and taxes and retirement, probably because death and debt are what's on everybody's mind, right? So kind of the media is doing the job for us. They're, you know, they're putting it out there. And so with that being said, um, how often or what do you suggest around a signature talk being around a topic like estate planning or around Social Security, which was really big before more recent, where, de where taxes and retirement and estate planning became bigger uh, draws? Yes, I'm a big fan of testing and I'm a big fan of trying different titles. But even as you're changing the titles of your talk, that doesn't mean you have to radically change the entire talk. In other words, if we switched out from retirement planning in a, in a time of crisis to estate planning, um, I think our opening story would probably stay the same. It'd be a story from the last 60 days of something we have universally experienced together, something very ordinary. So the audience can look at me and say, wow, he's just like me. Wow, he cares about his kids. He, he worries about his future just like me. Uh, I think your content will change a little. Yep. Honestly, I would never give a presentation without touching on income because people need to understand the idea of income that lasts a lifetime, of monthly income. I'd probably never give a presentation that doesn't talk about what happens you know, when you die. Will my spouse be okay? Will my kids be okay? Mm -hmm. Those are universal. <clears throat> and so... We can change the title, keep the opening story and the closing story and the call to action. Call to action never changes. Click on the yeah. button and schedule an appointment. So yeah. the whole thing is plug and play. Now, I might swap out my first topic and have it be estate planning if the title was estate planning. Uh, yeah. If the title was taxes, I might swap out the first and talk about taxes first, but I'd roll right out of that into income because that's, that's what you do and that is what everybody worries about and that is what everybody needs. So 
it, it's a little bit of uh, sell them what they what sell them what they want and give them what they need. But I think people, you know, are attracted to the topic of the day, and I, I don't mind testing those. I don't mind putting on four of them or advertising four of them and seeing which one draws the fastest response and the biggest response. I just want you to know that when you do that, when you change the topic that you've been presenting on, that doesn't mean you have to change your opening story. It doesn't mean you have to change all three sections of your content. You can change the first one and keep income in there. You can keep taxes or protection or legacy in there. And then you don't change your call to action and you don't have to change your closing story. You can change the title and change one small part of your presentation and you're actually meeting the audience's needs. You're drawing bigger crowds for less money and your conversion rate is going to be through the roof. Makes perfect sense. Thank you so much, Pat. Say the uh, website again and your email, if you would, please. You can learn more about our two-day workshops to help advisors put together the perfect signature talk that works one-on-one -on -one or one-to-many online and on stage at advanceyourreach.com. And you can email me with any questions at pat at advanceyourreach.com. Thank you so much, Pat. Absolutely. Thanks for the opportunity. It's been great. All right. And thank, thank everyone for joining the Rainmaker Multiplier uh, podcast, and we'll catch you on the next one. Thank you. The Rainmaker Multiplier On Demand series is brought to you by Clarity to Prosperity, a financial training, coaching, and IP development organization led by financial advisors, coaches, and business leaders committed to taking a holistic approach to advising. To learn more about our organization and upcoming training opportunities for financial professionals, visit ClarityToProsperity.com.